Welcome to the Nursing Post podcast, All Nursing All the Time, with Ashley Moore and Rosa Horsley. In this episode, we discuss genetically modified organisms, better known as GMOs. Our goal is to inform, help, and start conversation. Think that you don't eat genetically modified foods? Think again. Many foods on the shelves contain something that has been genetically modified. Maybe you didn't know this because we sure didn't until we started researching this. Absolutely. Eye-opening. So what's a GMO? It's defined as an organism produced through genetic modification, pretty much just like its name says. Genetic engineering works by transferring individual genes from one organism to another. And this is already happening. This has already been done. There's different hybrids of flowers. You know, we do this with wheat, sweet potatoes. We've created and invented seedless grapes using this technology and different types of tomatoes. Right. And this was developed in the 1970s. So we've been doing it for a while. Yes. This is not new. This is not new. This is how we get those blue colored flowers and those black roses. Yes. And we this we've been doing this for a little bit. Right. So in 1976... A major biotech company manufactured an herbicide. In 1982, human insulin became a GMO. In 1992, the FDA declared that GM crops are generally recognized as safe as long as their producers say they are safe. So just with that, I like to just hit on that human insulin being now genetically modified and made in a lab because it used to be derived from pigs. Mm -hmm. And there's always been this, there's always been this stigma with GMOs that they're bad, Mm -hmm. but to make human insulin that's synthetic, that doesn't require another animal is pretty nice. It's pretty big. Mm -hmm. Um, Because if you have certain types of allergies Yes, like alpha gale. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't be able to use uh, insulin derived from a pig. Right. It would have to be synthetic. Right. And they were getting the necessary things to make insulin from pigs from the mm-hmm. slaughterhouses. So yeah, you know, that, that can, was like a little sketchy for me. It is. I could honestly, honestly be like a totally different podcast. Uh, <laughs> like it really could all in of itself. But just to think that we went from human insulin being genetically modified to now being able to make synthetic, um, that was a big discovery at the time. It, Absolutely. I mean, it kind of paved the way for insulin today. So major biotech company in 1996 introduced genetically modified soybeans, and it slowly introduced genetically engineered corn, cotton, and canola. And when these crops are sprayed with an herbicidal, all the plants except the resistant crops are killed. Right. So these patented seeds, um, these genetically modified seeds, whether they be corn or soybean, they are made to be resistant to herbicides. Right. So so when it's spray when the herbicides are sprayed, you know, it's killing the insects. Because that's its job, to mm-hmm. keep the crop safe. Right. But it's also resistant to the herbicide. So the hopes are that you wash it, it's gone, it doesn't cause any issues when you eat it. Like, that's the thought process. Right. And when you're spraying it, everything that you want to die dies. dies. And the thing that you don't want to die is not affected. Mm-hmm. So it's a great theory. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not a theory. It's a great it, we're, it, idea. It's doing it. Yeah. People are doing it. We're doing it right now. So these patented seeds, you have to purchase them directly from the manufacturer. If you don't directly purchase these patented seeds from the manufacturer, and let's say you have cross-contamination of some kind, you're on your land, you're not using, you know, these patented seeds, but the wind comes and blows from your neighbors who is using it. Now they're on your crops and you try to sell them. You can actually be sued for selling them because you're you have some of that patented seed right in your mix. It's very dynamic this whole process, especially if you're a farmer. And you would think 
that you just plant your stuff and let it grow and sell it yeah, and you're done. There's business. a lot of ins yeah. and outs that... No, there's a lot of um, fine print and red tape, especially if you are an organic farmer, which we'll talk about a little later. Right. Some of the curtain foods that we have here in the United States that are genetically modified are soybeans, which are 91% of all soybeans are genetically modified. Mm-hmm. Cotton, 71%. Canola is 88%. Corn is 85%. And then some vegetables that are about half are papaya, zucchini, squash, and 90% of sugar beets. So these are foods that we eat all the time. We're grabbing them right off of the off of the grocer's shelves and, yeah, every day. Right. And so you have, I mean, if you pick up corn... You have an 85% that is genetically modified, Mm -hmm. and it's not labeled. So you don't know if it's genetically modified or not. Yeah, the only labels right now are, you know, organic. Correct. And GMO. Like, you do see that on some cereal boxes and things like that. Yes. But I don't see that labeled on vegetables or fruits. Yeah, it's not in my produce section, for sure. So genetically modified foods are fed to the entire population, and... Like you said, they're not labeled, they're not monitored, because as long as the farmer states that they're safe, then they're safe. Because they said so. So it's kind of difficult or impossible to track if you're trying to stay away from genetically modified foods. And, and there's a couple of different thought processes there. Mm-hmm. Do we really need genetically modified foods? I don't know. We get into that a little bit more later. but Yeah, we do talk about the pros and cons. Uh, the, uh, the fact is they're here and we're already consuming it. Yes. That's that's just the fact of the matter. Absolutely. And for your meat, is this genetically modified? And this was an interesting read because I thought, well, no, I don't think they are. Yeah, you're not thinking your cow, when you're thinking GMO and meat, you're not thinking your cow has been genetically you know, modified, right? No, exactly. I was like, okay, yeah, so how is this going to tie together? So. of our corn crops in the United States um, are genetically modified, and 36% of that goes to animal feed. So that goes to show you we're in the upper 80s for the corn that's genetically Mm -hmm. modified. It all depends on what article you read. Yeah. But more than 80% is genetically modified, and 36% of that's going to animal feed. So they're eating foods that are genetically modified, Mm -hmm. these Animals yeah. are cows, chickens, chickens cows, like that. pigs, all of it, yeah. And so that's a third of our resources that are being eaten by animals. So corn uh, makes up the majority of crops given to livestock. So that means like the feed mixes. Mm-hmm. If you just look at the back of the ingredients, the main one is usually There's corn. corn. Genetically modified soy is another crop that is huge in our meat and dairy industry. of soy crops grown in America become animal feed. That means the vast majority of soy crops in the United States are genetically modified varieties going to animal agriculture. Yeah, feed. Yeah. It's animal feed. And so there's a big unity of genetically modified in animals because that's pretty much what our animals are consuming. Well, for me, everything always traces back to the dollar and cents, right? Yes. What can you make quicker? What can you make least expensive? Feed. So you could feed your animals more at a less expense, right? Right. And they say that this helps actually reduce carbon footprint Mm -hmm. by having all this genetically modified foods. And when you plant a farm, there you know that a certain amount is going to be waste. Mm -hmm. Not every plant is going to grow and produce and... There's issues with insects and things like that. So that's why organic stuff is more expensive because they have to fight, you know, rodents Mother and Nature and, raw. Right, yeah. Mother Nature without anything, mm-hmm. really, as to where these other farmers who are using these genetically modified products. They're a step ahead. They're a step ahead. Mm-hmm. So they can plant more and they can spray with their, you know, herbicide, herbicide yeah. and... Hey, I'm good. It killed all the bad stuff. My good stuff's great. So I don't have to worry about mm-hmm. pests and I don't have to worry about weeds. And I know my crops are going to be good. So, yeah, makes sense to me. 
So that leads us into some of our confounding issues, right? right? So GMO crops linked with pesticides, specifically glyphosate, you know, from petunias. <laughs> that, that's where you can find glyphosate. They're pretty flowers. They are. They're beautiful. Um, but there's no scientific evidence that links glyphosate to disease. In January of 2020, the EPA states that herbicides and pesticides are safe if used as labeled and are not a known carcinogen. So according to an article from the New York Times um, that was released June of 2020, it talks about a manufacturer as part of a $1.25 billion lawsuit. And within that lawsuit settlement, they're going to have to establish an independent expert panel to resolve two questions about glyphosate. Does it really cause cancer? And if so, what's the minimum dosage or exposure level that's considered dangerous? So you have the EPA telling you that it's not harmful to your health, but then you have a major lawsuit settlement of $1.25 billion saying that it can probably cause, you know, cancer. Cancer. Yeah, absolutely. And this is one of the things that I found most interesting. And I think that once this independent expert panel comes out, there will be a lot of questions that are answered. Absolutely. But if you have a payout of $1.25 billion, there's some pretty good evidence that this is not safe, in my opinion. Absolutely. Usually lawsuits don't resolve that many zeros for, yes, yeah, sorry that this may have happened. I just want to kind of get this lawsuit to go away. We'll just pay you. Mm-hmm. That's too many zeros for that. That's a lot of zeros. So I'm kind of curious to see what this panel and their scientific research shows. Absolutely. So there are some pros and cons to genetically modified foods. We kind of came in this thinking that we would be very anti-GMO. I was like, let's resist. (laughs) That was my mentality coming in. And my thought process is like, I'm already eating it. But I'd like to know that I'm eating it. Like, mm-hmm. it's a lot of it's not labeled. Meats aren't labeled. Foods aren't, produce aren't labeled. Some of the, like, processed foods are, like the packaged foods. Yeah. But it's some things that many. you would think that, this, there's nothing in here that's genetically modified. And I pick up a box of cereal and I'm like, huh. This is genetically this is modified. This is genetically modified, which I found to be interesting. But some of the pros are a lower price point. For consumers. There was an analysis of the production and prices of impacts of biotech crops that was done by Graham Brooks and others. Mm -hmm. They estimated that corn-based products would be priced 6% higher and soybean-based products would be 10% higher if it weren't for genetically modified crops. That's a, that's a big increase. That is a big increase. And when you start thinking about everything that has corn in it, it's everything that everything. has soy. Yeah. That's a lot. All of like your dairy free products, that's all soy based. Mm-hmm. And then this would also increase the cost of feed because we just talked about corn and soy with Absolutely. feed. So the cost to have livestock would go up. So then your meat, meat prices gonna go are going to go up. So that, there, it's a triple effect. It compounds. Absolutely. There's a lower production cost for farmers. Mm-hmm. We kind of did touch on that. Uh, there's greater durability and nu- nutritional value f- uh, for health benefits. So we can make foods more nutritious by genetically modifying them. Mm-hmm. We're enriching foods. foods. Yeah. There's an increased resistance among crops to plant diseases caused by insects and viruses. So we're helping kind of like build their immune system mm-hmm. in a sense. That's kind of my thought process on it. The foods taste better because we know yeah. what we like. And so we just make more of that. The increased food supply with reduced costs because of longer shelf life. Yeah, and we'll talk about that when we go into like organics. Yeah. Yeah, and then lastly, uh, medicinal foods that 
could be used as vaccines or other medicines because there are vaccines that are out there that are genetically modified. Um, well, yeah, I learned the other day in vaccines, there are different generations of vaccines, and I'm not going to talk about this long, but I just wanted to bring it back to this. Um, I did not know that they used yeast because of its um, ability to replicate quickly mm -hmm. for vaccines. I didn't know that. So to me, I mean, that was mind blowing. GMO. Yes. GMO and vaccines. So it is used in medicine every day. Well, you have your vaccines, mm -hmm. you have your insulin, mm -hmm. there are antibiotics, mm -hmm. all of that. It's not. That's awesome. It's not natural. Yeah. These are chemicals. These are lab made products. Mm -hmm. They're safe. They're tested. Not against that at all. But when people are like very anti GMO, well, saving your life. It is. So let's talk about some of the cons. As we mentioned, uh, no food labels are on current and future GMOs. This makes it a lot difficult if you have allergies yourself or if your family and your children have allergies and you're trying to, you know, avoid a particular ingredient. Right. Okay. We kind of touched a little bit about this lawsuit and the cancer research and findings. The American Cancer Society has said that there is no evidence that GMOs are linked to cancer. However, they note that no evidence of harm is not the same as proof of safety and that researching a conclusion will require more research. Absolutely. And that makes sense to me. Well, yeah. I mean, just because you can't prove it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, another con is antibacterial resistance. So as we know, GMOs, their whole purpose of being is to resist insects, bacteria, germs, all that good stuff. Right. But in medicine, we all know and recognize that strains mutate and they change and that this can even happen with your GMOs. Sure. I mean... When you start modifying, genetically modifying something, I always think that there's a consequence that you don't account for. Yeah, I mean, they become resistant. I mean, we have super bugs. Already. Already. Mm -hmm. So it's not far-fetched to think if you're already using an herbicide and a resistant GMO, if mm -hmm. that it's not impossible to think that it will eventually become resistant to that herbicide. Sure. Food for thought. And then what about outcrossing? You're, we have two farmers. Your neighbor on the left, you know, is planting those patented GMO seeds, right? Okay. And the farmer and your neighbor on the right has decided to go all organic. Let's say, I don't know, you live somewhere that's really windy in the middle of nowhere. So whatever crops are growing on the left and a big wind gust comes or a sandstorm or whatever, tornado, whatever, sure. comes through from the left to the right. So now you have outcrossing from your GMO onto your organic. It's not organic anymore. That organic farmer probably will not be able to sell his crops because he can no longer label them as organic because now they have GMO material. Right. That's a lot of money. That is a lot of money, especially because there's such stiff regulations when you look at mm -hmm. organic farming. And when you see all of this time and effort that go into making sure that everything is all organic, it does make you realize why organic foods are more expensive. More expensive, yeah. You got to, I definitely have um, a respect for organic farming. So GMOs are prohibited in organic products. Yes. The USDA organic regulation describes organic agriculture as an application of practices that support the cycling of on-farm resources. They promote ecological balance and conserve biodiversity. These include maintaining or enhancing soil and water quality conserving wetlands, woodlands, wildlife, and avoiding the use of synthetic fertilizers, sewage sludge, 
irradiation and genetic engineering. So basically, if you're an organic farmer, all you have is the no. dirt and the seed. Right. Yeah, it's all it's all natural. You can't plant any GMO seeds. Your cows cannot eat any GMO, you know, feed mm-hmm. or livestock because, you know, there's more than just cow out there. Um, so your chickens can't have it, your pigs, your cows. An organic soup producer can't use any GMO ingredients at all. Right, and this gets difficult because of the outcrossing. The outcrossing. It's also called genetic drift. It's the same. You know, it's mother nature. It's like the birds and the bees. And how upset would do you think a person would be that spent their entire livelihood creating this organic farm and then they get into... A situation where they may not be able to sell their stuff as organic. Mm-hmm. And because it takes more time and effort and money to grow organic crops, even if they sell them for non-organic, that's a loss of money for them. It is because they're having to sell at GMO prices, which we've already said are cheaper. Yes. Because there's uh, less expense in making GMOs. Right. So they're already at a loss, double loss actually at that point. So we do know that if a product has a USDA organic label, that it doesn't have a GMO. That's your one way of... That's your only way of knowing, I think, right now. That you're not consuming a GMO. If you're eating all organic all the time, it's, mm-hmm. then you're you're in a good spot. It's non-GMO. But if you're not, there's you're probably... We're consuming it. Consuming it. I know I am. I am too, so... Organic farming practices for livestock, because you now can go to the grocery store and purchase organic meats. Yes. Your your chicken will be labeled organic, Mm -hmm. your beef will be labeled organic, and so on and so on. So they have to provide healthy living conditions and lots of access to the outdoors. The pasture feeding for at least 30% of livestock's nutritional needs are grazing, being out there in the wilderness, eating off the land. Right. As Mother Nature intended. Right, at their leisure. Yep. Organic foods for animals, because, you know, that does exist. There are organic feeds. There are, you know, organic vegetables. So they have to be able to feed that to their livestock. Right. Um, Vaccinations. I think everybody, I I think everybody knows that that vaccinations exist with when livestock. Yeah. yeah, I would assume. So organic livestock raised for meat, eggs, and dairy products must be given organic feed. They cannot receive antibiotics, growth hormones, or any animal byproducts at all. Right. So they need to eat what they were intended to eat. If it's a feed, it has to be organic, mm-hmm. and they have to be able to graze. They can't just be in a barn that's limited and they can't go outside. Mm -hmm. It has to be, you know, like free-range chicken. Yeah, that's what they're, I mean, that's how Mother Nature intended it. What are the pros to eating organic foods? They are nutrient-rich. They have increased flavonoids, um, which have antioxidant properties. So that's... Mm -hmm. They taste better, and they're better for you. Uh, Yes. They are high in the omega-3 fatty acids, which, of course, that's the good fat. Mm -hmm. And primary use of grass and feed for cattle result in generally high levels of that omega-3 fatty acid. And so since it's more heart-healthy than other fats, and they're found in organic meats and dairy and eggs, those are considered better for you. They have less toxic metal related to the ban on synthetic fertilizers. There are lower levels of pesticide residue. If you have a sensitivity to pesticides, that's going to be really important because with the other fruits and vegetables, they are just kind of sprayed and Mm -hmm. get to wash them very well. We should wash all of your fruits and vegetables very well, but these have less pesticides that remain on the outside. And then meats produced conventionally have higher occurrences of bacteria resistant to antibiotics. 
So the overall risk of bacterial contamination of organic food is, is the same as conventional food. So you're not mm-hmm. at an increased risk because they're not given antibiotics. Yeah. So that's why that's in there. So let's talk about organic versus GMO. BT has been used as pesticides on organic crops. Then there's feelings about, you know, what they call Frankenstein fear. What happens if there's fruits and vegetables that aren't quite right, don't look quite right, may taste delicious, but might not necessarily look delicious? How do consumers trust what they're getting from that? Well, that's a hard thing to think about because they're safe because the farmer said they were safe. Yeah, because I said so. Mm -hmm. And then we have, you know, superbugs now for GMOs because in nursing we all know that things become resistant Mm -hmm. and mutate and change. Uh, 70% of processed foods in the U.S. have GMO. That's all. It's all in your grocery store. Yes. It's all up and down every aisle. There's really no way. It's very hard, I should say, at this point to right. not have something with GMO in it. Um, it's being used as feed for livestock and cattle. And in 2016, the GMO report concluded that GMOs are not needed to feed the world. Everybody came out in the beginning of this and said, We need GMOs. GMOs are going to save the world. It's going to feed all of the people in all of the world, and this is why we need to do it. We're not feeding the entire world. We're not feeding the entire world. There's enough food for the world, so it's not a lack of food. The issue is distribution. Absolutely. How to get it to the people. That need it. Absolutely. And there's so much waste in the United States with food. It's unreal. It is. It's, it's absolutely crazy. Um, there's the same yield from GMO and non-GMO crops um, through conventional breeding. So plant breeding and seed breeding, better land soiling. Right. Like all these things help contribute to, you know, better product. And just a fun fact, GMOs like uh, genetically modified foods like uh, corn and rice are banned in China. Yeah, that's interesting to think about the future of our foods and genetic modification because we are starting to genetically modify, it seems like, everything. Correct. Uh, Literally everything. And when you look at gene editing, and we had done a previous podcast on this CRISPR technology and Mm -hmm. how you can use that, which is this, you know wonderful, easy to use, affordable gene editing tool, Mm -hmm. why not try it? And I'm sure that's what scientists are saying. Well, why can't we try it? We have this great tool and I'm sure they're doing it. I'm sure they're doing it right right now. And so what's going to come next? Well, within possible foods, making their debut into restaurants and the grocers freezers. I mean, that's already here. We've already seen it. So the FDA has approved to regulate cell cultured meats, lab grown meats, or the popular term impossible meats. So the question is, would you want to know that your meat that you're buying is labeled as natural or lab grown? Do you want to have that knowledge when you go to the store and decide I want to make, I don't know, spaghetti for dinner? I think I'd want to know. It's interesting to think about lab-grown meat. It is. That does not sound appetizing. It doesn't. It doesn't. And I think if it was labeled, would you buy it? No. Really? I don't know. No, I'm not buying uh, lab-grown meat. That's weird. It is weird. I know. Because it's a, it's kind of like against nature. Like, I get it. Yeah. I, I mean, I I'll, totally take my, get it. I'll take my lab-grown antibiotic in a minute. <laughs> So let's be clear. I'm not against yeah, the lab. No, I'm not against the lab either. If it if it will help heal me, um, I'm consider it. But I don't want lab grown meat because that's weird. Yeah. And in ten years, somebody's gonna listen to this and be like, 
Well, why, why is that weird? Talking? Yeah. That's why it'll be, what it's it'll gonna be, be normal. Be. It'll be normal and you know, we'll be old and <laughs> and we'll <laughs> still be eating our four legged creatures. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, it's interesting. I'm I'm excited about all the technology that's come thus far. Absolutely. And where it's going to go in the future. Lab created cells or whatever for meats. It's it sounds weird, it does. Shoot, soon you'll be taking a pill. See, this is my lunch. <laughs> I like to chew. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah. That's all you have to take. Yeah, just take this and it'll give you all the nutrients you need. Oh my god. I like to chew. So do we know how far is too far when it comes to genetically modified foods or organisms in general? According to a Forbes article, uh, nature is already making changes to food, which is considered transgenic. (laughs) And this means that there is DNA from other plants making their way into our foods naturally. Mm -hmm. So DNA from another plant that's not associated with the one plant. Birds and the bees. Right. So even organic foods contain the trans genetic modifications that happen in nature and would we consider these genetically modified or not i mean nature did it it's they're not the, the definition same. is the same right? right and it may make you think twice because some of those trans genetic foods are beer tea peanuts bananas i mean that's just a couple but yeah, to a large list yes and i I'm, what, three into the four that you've already listed. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. As always, we link our references to our website, thenursingpostpodcast.com. We would love for you to join the conversation and leave your comments and suggestions there, too. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast, listen to us on your favorite platform, and you can always follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Thanks again for listening to The Nursing Post.